Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Our Bible text this morning is Luke 9, 1 through 6, and then 10 through 31. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And then he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bread, no bag, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If the people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And so they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Verse 10. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him and they withdrew themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But when the crowds learned about it and followed him, he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place. Jesus replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for this coal crowd. About 5,000 men were there, just the men. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets of long ago that has come back to life. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, and he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed on the third day, then raised to life. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. This ends our reading for today. Now, this is our second installment in uh, what we Presbyterians call the Great Ends of the Church. Last week, we examined the proclamation of the gospel for salvation of humankind. This week, we consider the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. Let's break that down a bit. First, I am taking children of God to refer to all human beings. We are all made in God's image. We are all, in a sense, God's children. Shelter, I take to mean covering protection and comfort, a barrier against harm. It would certainly include health care. Nurture refers to anything necessary for growth. People need clean water, food, some education, some hope for the future. And lastly, spiritual fellowship involves human contact, companionship, love, kindness, and caring. The inclusion of spiritual fellowship in this great end means that even if you were to come up with some means of, I don't know, creating a pill that provided all the nutritional needs for people and little robot messengers to deliver them to feed every person in the world, we still would not have fulfilled this great end of the church. People would still wither for lack of spiritual fellowship. Many years ago, I took a youth group on something called the Midnight Run. 
the midnight run takes food to homeless people in Manhattan right around midnight when there isn't much traffic. One of the things our young Christians learned is the tremendous loneliness and isolation that comes from being homeless and poor. When you haven't had a bath in a week and you're dressed in ragged clothes and are sitting on the sidewalk with a green plastic garbage bag next to you, who's going to stop and talk to you? What a gift it is when someone does. Yes, providing for the material needs of, of the needy cannot be underestimated, but providing compassion and spiritual fellowship is equally important. So to fulfill this great end, we would not only need to provide housing, shelter, for everyone in the world, get food to everyone in the world, nurture, we would also need to combat loneliness for every person in the world, spiritual fellowship. Kind of sounds like a big job, huh? In Luke chapter 9, the disciples faced a big job too. They were noticing this crowd of about 5,000 men, plus women and children, way out in the middle of nowhere that had been listening to Jesus. They suggested to Jesus that he better tell them to go home so they could get some food. And Jesus just looked at them and said, you give them something to eat. <laughs> but Jesus, we have only five loaves and two fish. Here we come to the crux of the matter, one of the pivotal points of faith. Every day, constantly, Jesus looks at us and says, you give them something to eat. You provide shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship to all the children of God. And our eyes get big, and we look at Jesus, and we exclaim, uh, but, but, but Jesus, we have only five loaves and two fish, a few thousand dollars, three cans of corn, and some leftover sloppy joes. Oh, oh, and a couple of bags of microwave popcorn. That's just not enough to do much for the billions of people in the world who need shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship. And that's a true statement. It isn't enough to make much of a dent in the problem. But Jesus still makes the demand on us. And that stresses us out. It has to. Jesus incessantly demands that we take care of all these people, but we don't have enough resources to do so. And that leaves us in a tension between Jesus' command and our limited resources. So what do we do about that? There are three possible positions I can think of. The first way, really the best one, if you can do it, you get away from the tension by taking a vow of poverty and giving away everything you have. Simple. This was Mother Teresa's way. Whenever she got anything, she immediately gave it away to provide shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship for the children of God. She gathered a large following who did the same thing and helped many people. Whenever Jesus said to her, you give them something to eat, she could look back and say, I already did that, and I have nothing left. And great is her reward in heaven. Think about that. The second possible response to the tension between our limited resources and the need is to just blow Jesus off. Jesus looks you in the eye and says, you give them something to eat, and you say, let them get their own darn food. I worked hard to get my five loaves and two fishes. The only reason I, they don't have any food is because they are lazy and stupid. It's not my responsibility. Buzz off, Jesus. Yeah, no tension there either. And Jesus just shakes his head and says, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. What's the third course? Jesus looks at us and says, you give them something to eat. And we say, but Jesus, we don't have enough to make a difference. And Jesus says, I know, but do what you can. The third way is not a way out of the tension. It is a way of living with the tension. Yes, Jesus constantly wants us to do more. No, we don't have enough to provide the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship to all the children of God. Yes, that's stressful, but that's life. And you do what you can. That's what the disciples did. They didn't have enough food. But when Jesus told them, make them sit down in groups of about 50 each, that's what the disciples did. They obeyed him. And when Jesus told them to distribute the five loaves and two fishes to the crowd, they did it. 
and all ate and were filled. What was left over was gathered up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. In other words, they had more food left over when they were done than when they started. Now, I'm not one of those prosperity theology television preachers who will promise you that God will fill your bank account if you only send me $29.99 for my latest trinket or book. But I will say that most everyone I know who gives generously for the Lord's word says that they always seem to have plenty left over. In fact, most tithers I know will tell you that things get worse if they stop tithing, and a few of them have tried it. And I don't know anyone who regrets having given generously to the Lord for the shelter and nurture and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. But what about the other people of Galilee who were not on that hillside that day in Luke 9? Weren't they hungry too? No doubt they were. For that matter, weren't those 5,000 men plus women and children hungry again the next day? No doubt they were. But they weren't hungry that day. They were filled. I wonder if it's even possible for us to appreciate the amazing wonder of that. Probably isn't possible for me, perhaps for some of you. Maybe people who experienced the Great Depression or, you know, have lived through an actual famine in a foreign country or felt intense hunger up close. Perhaps some of you who served in the armed forces at a time when you were cut off from supplies. Maybe some gathered here today have experienced this kind of deep hunger at some point, maybe on the street. If so, then you may have a special compassion for the crowd with Jesus that day. I can't help but notice that the passage right before the feeding of the 5,000 is when Jesus sends out his disciples, telling them to take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. I believe the reason for that is that he wanted them to experience what it was like to be dependent on others for their needs, so they might learn to have compassion on the needy. Last week, we spoke about the need for head knowledge and heart knowledge. We return to that theme now for the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. We can understand problems like world hunger with our minds, and our minds can help us to be wise with our stewardship of resources. But more important is the need for heart knowledge, which is compassion for the needy. The disciples got both. They understood the need, and they understood what it was to be needy. That was what helped forge the disciples to serve Christ's church. It is one piece of what made them the mature, vibrant Christians they would become. The simple serving of food to the hungry, the following Jesus' instructions, and the gathering up of the baskets of leftovers allowed them to witness the power and the love of Christ firsthand. And this is the concluding point. Jesus commands us to this end or goal or purpose of the church to provide for the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, not just for the benefit of those we shelter and nurture and fellowship with. Although Jesus does care about them deeply, he commands us also to do these things for our own benefit, to help us mature as Christians, and to focus on the church toward its mission. So that as we care for the children of God, we ultimately wind up with more left over than we started with. Praise be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.